Now that we understand the idea behind Huffman coding, let's talk about some practical issues we need to deal with when we want to actually use it. So there's two possible ways that one could use Huffman compression. The first philosophy is that for each input type, say English text, Chinese text, images, Java source code, we would get a bunch of different inputs together from that category. So we take, say, all English texts that we can find. We then use that representative set of texts, also known as a corpus, to create a standard code for English, for Chinese, for pictures, and so forth. The other approach is, actually, rather than having a standard encoding for English, let's say for every possible input, we create a unique code just for that single input file. And then, of course, when someone receives the file, they're going to need to know how to decode it, so we're going to have to send along the code with the compressed file. So I have here at the bottom of the slide some examples of how that might work. If we're using philosophy one, we would specify, for example, I want to use the English corpus and use that to compress Moby Dick. Or if I wanted to compress some picture of a horse, I use the corpus for bitmaps. Now, by contrast, the second philosophy, we wouldn't specify a corpus. We would just say, hey, please compress Moby Dick. And it would analyze Moby Dick and build a code just for Moby Dick and then send a lot or create a compressed file that includes not just the compressed data, but also the code needed to decompress it. Okay. So a question for you. What are some good and bad points of each idea? What do you like about them? Uh, and which do you think is better? So in live lecture today, we collected some answers. I won't go through them, but they're here in case you're curious. And I'll give you my answers. Now, I kind of cheated a little. I didn't actually give advantages and disadvantages, but I'm capturing what I think is the most important distinction. So approach one, I will note, will result in a suboptimal encoding. That is, we will not get the minimum theoretical bits per symbol because of the fact that we haven't tuned our input, or sorry, we have not tuned our code to exactly match our input. So Moby Dick, for example, we're gonna use the general uh, frequencies for all English texts, but maybe Moby Dick doesn't exactly match that because it uses, I don't know, whatever, like it, the author's quirk, quirks and how he wrote just don't happen to match the usual distribution of letters, could happen. Approach two, by contrast, requires us to use extra space for the code word table. That is, I need to actually put the code in the compressed bitstream somehow, so you're gonna pay a little bit of overhead. And so that's the disadvantage of each. Now in practice, it turns out that approach two generally works better, and the basic idea is that for very large inputs, like say the entire text of Moby Dick, the code word table is gonna be pretty small compared to all of the compressed data for the entire like, story in the case of Moby Dick. Okay. So generally speaking, approach two is what people use. All right, so now that we know that, let's see an example of how compression would actually look. So this is a demo that you can step through if you'd like. And now we're gonna finally get to see some data get compressed. So in this case, our input symbols are given here. Now, of course, our input symbols are by default specified in 32-bit Unicode or similar. Uh, and so I'm not showing you the input bit stream, but be aware that for each of these characters, there's some number of bits, in this case, 32, uh, that are the uncompressed bit stream. So the first step is to look at each symbol and count the frequencies. So for example, there are 35 of this character, 15 of this, 17 of this, and so forth. We will then divide by 100 for each and get the relative frequencies. The next step is to build the data structures that allow us to encode and decode this input. So to do that, I go through the same step, the David Huffman set of steps, and ultimately get back this. This is our code. And I can represent that as both a decoding try and an encoding map. And this may also just be an array, depending how you do things, as we mentioned earlier. So we need some kind of data structure that takes each symbol and gives us code words, and then we need a way to go back. So now that we have this decoding try, the next step is I'm actually going to write this decoding try out to my output file, which I'll call output.huff. Now, how does that work? Well, the basic idea is that this is the information needed to decode the input. And so I need to represent that in the compressed bit stream. Now, in this case, I'm not gonna tell you how this works, but the optional textbook does go into some detail about how to actually do this. I'm not gonna say here, 
But suffice it to say, by doing some kind of tree traversal on this tree, we could output it as a sequence of bits. And you might find that interesting to experiment with. OK, so now that we've written this out to a file, just trust me, there exists a way below the level of abstraction for this lecture to take this decoding try and put it in a file. So now the last step is we need to actually write out the text. So far, all we've done is written out the code. We need to write out all these symbols. So we're going to look at this first symbol and go to our encoding map and say, ah, well, that's just 0. So we add a 0 to our output stream. Next bit, OK, we write out a 0. Uh, sorry, next symbol, we write out a 0. Next symbol, well, in my encoding map, I see that's 1, 1, 1. Okay, so I write out 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, and now, what's this going to be? So even if you don't know Chinese, you can look in this table and see that it will be 1, 0, 1. And then we get, well, more bits. So I don't want to do any more <laughs> because it's a little redundant. Okay. So now at this point, ultimately, what I'm going to do is the sequence of bits I send out to the receiver or that I write out to a file will be the decoding try. And it will be followed by all of the code words representing the symbols uh, that we'd like to send. So that's it for encoding. In the next video, we'll see an example of decoding. Uh, that, that, that right there is the heart of Huffman compression. And ultimately, we hope, and it should be the case, that this is much smaller. That is, each one of these Chinese characters we're representing by between 1 and 3 bits. And so this long sequence we expect to be smaller, so long as the overall overhead for the decoding try is not too great, which, if you do the experiment, you'll find it is not.